Well, I'm back, guys. Good afternoon. This is Johnny Bell, Jay Bell, coming to you from Wellspring Whole Body Fitness, guys. Fitness for your spirit, your soul, and your body. Let me just say one thing before I get started here um, with my message. I'm not looking for anyone to follow me uh, as a YouTube YouTuber. Really not. What I am looking for you to do, though, is to follow Jesus. I want to, everything that I share here on this social media page, I want you to line it up with the Word of God. I want you to be like the Bereans who were more nobler than the Thessalonians, that they would follow the Word daily to make sure that Paul and Barnabas were preaching the truth. You find this in, in Acts 17, 11. And because uh, we're all responsible before God. Now, every person that ministers the Word of God or teaches it or preaches it is going to incur stricter judgment. The Bible tells us that. But we can't be afraid to share truth. So I'm asking the Lord to just, you know, filter out anything that's of me. Because, guys, everybody misses it. We all miss the mark. We all fall short of the glory of God. I don't care how good you think you are or how bad you think you are. There's no goodness that can get you to heaven, and there's no badness that can keep you out. I know, I don't know if that's correct grammar or not. But what I'm saying is Jesus is the way, the only way. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the word of God. I'm not trying to do Greek or Hebrew on it. It's just plainly, plain and simple. If you read in John 3.3, 3, Jesus told a religious leader, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's not, that's not hard to understand. And so how can you get born again? By committing your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And then begin to grow in the things of God. Not, it's, we're not in this, it's not a competition that we're in here. I'm not competing against anyone else to be how eloquent I am or how smart I am, how much scripture I know, because I don't know everything. No one does. Only God knows everything. And no one has it all figured out. Anybody that tells you they have it all figured out, I would not be uh, listening to them very much. If I ever tell you that I have it all figured out, turn my channel off and unsubscribe. Because I don't. Nobody does. Jesus is the only one that knows everything, because he is the beginning, he is the end, he is the first, he is the last, he is the one who was, the one who is, and guys, the one who is to come, he's coming back soon, and he's going to judge everything, and nobody's going to say anything, but just listen, stand there and listen, and it's my prayer that everyone that's listening here, that you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and not the great white throne judgment. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit here today as I get more into the message. So you remember um, in my last message, I talked about the pride of religion from Luke 18, where you have a tax collector and then you have a Pharisee leader. Okay. So the Pharisee leader was talking about how he does all of these religious things. He, he tithes, he fasts, he does all. And there's nothing wrong. You should tithe and you should fast if you're a believer. The Bible instructs us to do that. But you don't brag about it. That doesn't make you get you closer to God than anyone else. But here, this is what he does. He brags about all of these things that he did, you know, and he tithes and maybe he even reads the scripture. Maybe he even does a whole lot of other religious things. To get looked at, to get noticed. And you know the reality of it is, if a person has that kind of an attitude when it comes to God, all, all the notoriety that they get, all the things that they get recognized is only going to be right here on this planet. And it won't, they won't get anything when they stand before God. Whereas this publican or this tax collector, the one who was, you know, they usually collect more taxes than what they're supposed to, this guy didn't even look up to God. He bowed his head down and said, God, I am a sinner. I have fallen short. I have missed the mark. And I need you, God, to cleanse me, to forgive me. Repent. See, this is a humble, repentant heart compared to a very proud person who bragged about how good they are. Uh, guys, it's really, no matter what message anyone shares, it's really all about Jesus. It always has been and it always will be. And it has to be through a relationship with him. I'm going to read from James uh, chapter 4 and verse 10. This is what God says to us as believers. Remember, the Bible is written to believers. Christians, uh, Jew Jewish Christians, and 
just Christian, Gentile Christians. This Bible is written to you if you're a believer. Now, if you're not a believer, then the things that the Bible says you may not even understand because they have to be spiritually discerned. Okay, so you might read it like a novel. God doesn't want us reading the word like a novel. He wanted us to read it as the true word of God. The Bible says that the word of God is living and powerful and is sharp at any two-edged sword, guys. It pierces to the division of the soul, the spirit, the joint, and the mouth. So it goes to the innermost part of our being and it judges our heart. So here's what James says. He's talking to believers. Now remember this, guys. It's about, he's talking to believers because all of us can fall into what he's saying here. He says, what is cause, and this is James 4, uh, and starting with verse 10. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? So we're talking about how God's going to finally eradicate evil from the world. So James is talking about this evil that comes from within us. He says, you want, he says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous for what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Now he goes in verse 3 and he says, And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. Verse 4, he's now, he says, You adulterers. Now we know what an adulterer is. Someone that is that's uh, uh, that uh, has intimacy with someone else's spouse. Okay, so God is looking at this. James is talking from a spiritual perspective because if we say we are married, that we are the bride of Christ, then we can't act like the world. We can't go against what the Word of God says and act like the world because that he says you are acting like an adulterer. He says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? He says, I say this again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourselves an enemy of God. So if we want to live like the world, be like the world, then we're going to be an enemy with God. You can't, you can't, I'm, I'm using this in a spiritual perspective, you can't sleep with the world and then go to sleep with God. That doesn't work, okay? That's what we call spiritual schizophrenia. You can't be one way one time and another way another time when it comes to God. Now, I'm not saying that like we don't make mistakes, guys, but I'm talking about this is a this is a practice that people sometimes can do when they think they're fooling God. He says, number first five, he says, don't you think scriptures have no meaning? Or do you think scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within you should be faithful to him, to him and him only. In verse 6, he says, he gives, grace, he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if you want to have the grace of God, you got to humble yourself. you got to humble yourself, just like James says. He says this in verse 7, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You cannot resist the devil if you don't walk in humility. Because the pride is the thing that got him kicked out of heaven. As a Lucifer. Got him cast out. Because I'm going to exalt myself above the throne of God. I will be like the most high God. I will do this and I will do that five times. He said it and God says no it's not going to happen. And so he got kicked out. And his judgment is coming. Just like every one of us. We're going to be judged. In verse 8, he says, Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor, or he will lift you up in due time. In verse 9, says, Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. This is, see, that's what you, when you read in Luke 18, this is exactly what the tax collector did. He bowed himself humbly and repentant before the Lord, like all of us must do. We can't let pride well up in us, thinking that we're all this and all that, and bragging about what I did and bragging about, you know, this. You, you're nothing without God. I'm nothing without God. And we have to remember that, guys, because if we don't, we're going to end up going down this trail. And somebody tries to call you out in love, 
who you think you are, who you think you are judging me. And see, that's what we always, we want to use that word. We don't judge me. Okay, I'll say this. I would rather for you to judge me and, and help me than for me to stand before God and be judged by him because I was too proud to listen to what somebody had to say to me. And I'm not saying people should be mean when they're calling you out. The Bible says that if you see a brother or sister that are going and erring the wrong way, you, you, would, you who are more spiritual, restore them in a spirit of gentleness, at least you be the one that has the problem. That's why it's so hard for me to listen to people who are making critical judgments on other people because they think they know everything. Maybe they might have missed something. But you don't know their heart. I don't know their heart. So instead of us being critical of them, we need to pray for them. And then if you do it according to the word of God, you take another person with you. And if they listen, then you restore that brother. And then they don't listen, you take another person. You do it, in other words, you do it God's way. And then you might win a brother and save a soul from death. And that's what we all need to do with each other. When I hear critical criticism of brothers about things, even if they missed it, I'm not going to be getting down on it. It would be just like, you know, when Apostle Paul, before he before he became an apostle, before God met him on the road to Damascus, this guy was out locking up and killing Christians. If you and I saw him, you were like, mm -mm. no, I ain't believe in him. I don't believe nothing. I don't, I don't believe he's saved. And so you would be making judgment on him, you know, and, and, and Paul wrote these letters, and, and I'll share a little bit of that. He wrote these letters to the church of Corinth who was struggling with their flesh and stuff, and, and they were they were more attracted to someone who was a, like an eloquent speaker or something than they were about the truth that Paul was sharing. Because Paul wasn't like, wasn't a great speaker, but he was telling the truth. He wasn't eloquent, eloquent, I guess he says the word eloquent or articulate, but he was speaking the truth. And sometimes we get captivated by a person and we miss Jesus. Let me say that again. Sometimes we get captivated by a person and we miss Jesus. I don't want to miss Jesus. And I hope you don't want to miss Jesus either. And so verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Again, or he will lift you up up in due time. So I want to share that, and I want to get into this message about when will God finally eradicate evil from the world? See, the thing is, if God was to eradicate, and I shared this, I think I shared it before in one of my other messages, if he was to eradicate evil from the world, who would be left? Right now. It sure wouldn't be you and I in the, in the good things that we may have done, because really, guys, we are all evil in our if you don't have Jesus in your heart, who the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you didn't say that prayer from your heart, like Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with your mouth you confess unto salvation and with your heart you believe unto righteousness. If you didn't say that from your heart, then you still got evil is controlling your life. You say, well, I'm not an evil person. What do you mean, God? I mean, listen, guys, evil doesn't always look evil. Okay. Let me say it again. Evil doesn't always look evil. If evil really looked evil, people would be recognizing Satan for who he is and what he's doing in our world today. But it doesn't always look evil. If he's a masquerader, the Bible tells us he masquerades. He appears like, uh, you know, uh, like an angel, like he's good and everything. Why? He doesn't want to just come out there and, like, you know, they portray evil in these movies. Because you would recognize it. You would run from it. He wants to draw you in. And he uses people to do it, guys. He uses people to do it. It's just the truth. The Bible says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the, the, uh, the evils in the heavenly realm. That's what we're battling against, but he uses evil people or people who have allowed evil to take control of their life. So all of us have missed that. 
And Jesus is the only one that can rectify that in every person's life. So, if he was to do that, so that's why I'm sharing from the Word of God how I believe God is going to eradicate evil from this world finally. So you remember in Genesis 3, you remember the fall and, and how Adam and Eve fell into deception and they, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, God never meant for us to know anything about evil. But when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then evil entered into the world through them, through them, through people. Satan was just the person who just kind of, you know, tricked them. If we'd have listened to God, then we would have never had this issue. But Satan was clever. God knows that if you eat from this tree, you become like him, knowing good and evil. God didn't meant for us to know good and evil. So the woman looked at the tree, saw that it was wise, that makes one wise. What kind of wisdom? Wisdom that certainly didn't come from above. Okay? And so when she did it, and when she gave to her husband, and he ate, then her eyes were open. And now they're exposed to things that God never meant for them to be. But here's, here's the good thing of God. Here's the good thing about God. So in Genesis 3, 20 to 24, it says, The man uh, named his wife Eve uh, because she was the mother of all living, all the living. The Lord made tunics, or animal skin, for Adam and his wife and clothed them to cover them, right? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in his fallen, sinful condition forever. Okay? I didn't write that. That's the word of God. He ate from the tree of... He says, he says that he become like one of us, knowing God. See, you have to remember thing. Remember one thing. God is God. Okay? He knows everything. Okay? But here's the problem. You and I don't. And we think we do and we want to do it our way. Then we're going to have it our way. And God says, okay, because you did this, I can't let you eat from this the tree of life and live in this fallen condition forever. Could you imagine living with pride and evil in your life in, a, in that condition forever? You would never have any relation. I can only imagine the agony. So, you guys, we have to die, okay? Literally die, okay? These bodies have to die, and God's going to give us new glorified bodies one day where we don't have to deal with sin and all the mess that we're in, in, in right now. So it says, therefore, God, uh, the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden so that so to till and cultivate the ground for which he was taken. So God drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he permanently stationed the cherubim, those are, these are angels, and a sword with a flashing blade which turned round and round in every direction to protect and guard the way, the entrance access to the Tree of Life. Now I'm reading from the Amplified Bible here, guys. So this, they would have been living in that prideful condition forever. And God says, no, that's not going to happen. Okay, never going to happen. Pride is what cost Lucifer and mankind their relationship with God. God has, has a restorative plan through Jesus for mankind, but not for angelic beings. The gospel message that Peter speaks of that angels long to look into. So if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, you're going to look at verses 10 to 12. It says, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for us. This is before Jesus had come in the flesh, okay? But the Bible, if you look in the Bible, you read the Bible, Jesus' handprint is all over it, and even in the Old Testament. You just have to read it on your own. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their message were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news, the gospel, has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful, get this, so that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen, or they're longing to look into these things which was talked about. Because guys, one day, 
when we all, as believers, get glorified bodies and come back to this earth with Jesus, we will be judging the world with Jesus. We will be ruling and reigning with him. That's what the Bible says, okay? You have to study on your own. Now, I'm going to show you a little short video. It's about a five-minute video of the tree of life, okay? Kind of give you a little bit more explanation of what this tree of life is all about. The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the tree of life. So what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it, or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Oh, you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground. Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seemed that way, but Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now this new tree of life stands before us all. We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it.
Okay, so this tree of life um, is for all Jews to eat from it. That's a day coming, guys. Um, unfortunately, um, we <laughs> messed up, but God had a plan. Okay, and this tree of life is still there. Because remember, it was being guarded, as we saw in Genesis 3, way back in Genesis 3, that tree of life was being guarded. But it's going to be available to us uh, as believers for all of eternity. So we won't have to eat from that tree and live in a sinful condition. Because why? Because we've been redeemed through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. So we have these new glorified bodies. You know, interesting thing, and, if I, and I can't tell you exactly where it was, but when Jesus had rose from the dead, uh, he had he he ate with the disciples with his with his glorified body. Because remember, Jesus had a human body like ours, but then he died. He was crucified on the cross, died for our sins, and then he rose from the dead three days later. And he appeared to many, and he actually had some food. I think he was having some fish. So we're gonna get to eat with these glorified bodies. So that should be exciting for all of us, guys, that we'll be able to to be able to do that. So. I'm just really excited about that. Um, so I want to continue uh, with this message. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop right now for just a few moments. I'm going to come back in about mm, maybe five to ten minutes. And we're going to get into the two judgments. So this part is just get us prepared for the two judgments that's going to be coming. The judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. So... This is all the God, this is all God's word. It ain't about me. It's about what the Word of God says, and you know each one of us should take that time to get into the Word of God as believers, so that we guys we can grow in respect to our salvation. Okay, because it's all about growing. It's not about you know giving your life to Jesus and just sitting back and just listening to somebody preach and teach you and stuff. We do that. I do. I listen to people, but I also get into the Word of God myself. And I like sharing it with others because this gospel must be preached in all the world before the end comes. So I don't know where we are, but I know it's being spread, especially with our technology that we have. So guys, I'll be back shortly uh, with more of this message uh, tonight. It won't be later on. And then we'll go into my home gym. You want to join me later on tonight. We're going to get into uh, a workout tonight. So uh, actually, I won't be recording tonight. I'll be recording tomorrow night for that workout. So I'll be in my gym uh, just working out, and uh, I'll catch you guys again uh, for another workout uh, tomorrow night. I'll call it Kaibo Tuesday. So let's have fun uh, later on. We'll get into the Word. Guys, and the, the Word of God should be enjoyable. If you know Jesus, you should be excited about hearing God's Word. So I'll be back shortly.